So, on this uh, next unit, COP 27. On 20th November 2022, the 27th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP27, that took place in the Egyptian coastal city of Sharm el Sheikh and concluded with the historic decision to establish and operationalize a loss and damage fund. Okay, so this is COP27, which happened in uh, Egypt in the month of November last year, 2022. Delivering for the people and the planet. On 20th November, the 27th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework on Convention on Climate Change, COP27, that took place in the Egyptian coastal city of Sharm el Sheikh, concluded with the historic decision to establish and operationalize a loss and damage fund. Welcoming the decision and calling the fund essential, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that most needs to be done to drastically reduce emissions now. The world still needs a giant leap on climate ambition. The red line we must not cross is the line that takes our planet over the 1.5 degrees temperature limit. He stressed urging the world not to relent in the fight for climate justice and climate ambition. We can and must win this battle for our lives as he concluded. From 6 to 20th November 2022, COP27 held high-level and side events, key negotiations and press conferences, hosting more than 100 heads of state and governments, over 35,000 participants and numerous pavilions showcasing climate action around the world and across different sectors. This is a picture from COP27. As the Sharm el Sheikh Climate Change Conference, COP27 countries came together to take action towards achieving the world's collective climate goals as agreed under the Paris Agreement and the Convention. The conference took place from 6 to 20th November 2022. Heads of states and governments attended it. Yeah. More details, you can refer this link. You know, here you will have a lot of details. So, let's see some, uh, you know, like uh, snapshots like how you know like these uh, impacts you know are uh, uh, you know like a changing over the you know like a period of time with consistent effort okay so this is this report you can uh, refer on its website UNAP's work on climate action if you search you will find it okay so a call to action you know to achieve one uh, gigaton of emissions reductions by forest by you know from forest by 2025 with that purpose Making good on the Glasgow Climate Pact, a call to action to achieve 1 gigaton of emissions reduction by forest by 2025. So, I'm, I'm, I'm just giving you the summary of, you know, like of this uh, report, executive summary. We are in an existential crisis, but forest can deliver for people and climate. So, definitely, like a forest, if you see, are the major, you know, like the resources and resource givers, you know, for our and every you know like almost every you know like a species is uh, sustenance which is you know living, living on the land right so the climate change and biodiversity crisis combined with challenges presented by wars food insecurity and pandemics are pushing us to the brink fortunately actions to protect sustainably manage and restore forests can deliver cost effective climate change mitigation at scale these actions can also reverse declines in biodiversity and enhance resilience to climate change. Indigenous peoples and local communities recognized as the most effective stewards of forest often play a key role in achieving these outcomes. Forest-based actions can make an essential contribution to meeting the ambition of the Paris Agreement with potential to provide nearly 27% of the solution to help avoid climate catastrophe. The gigaton milestone is an essential tool to measure progress towards climate and natural goals. Despite widespread recognition that we need forests to fend off the worst of the climate crisis, financing the forest-based solutions such as REDD+, you know, RED+, plus, you can uh, check for more details, okay, has been insufficient and slow moving. To help evaluate financial commitment for emissions reduction from forests, the Green Gigaton Challenge set a goal of mobilizing funds to pay for the equivalent of 1 gigaton of 
high integrity emission reduction from forest between 2020 to 2025 and yearly thereafter. This provides a much needed midterm milestone to assess progress towards meeting a range of goals and commitments of for forest and climate by 2030. We are not yet on track to meet the milestone. So as you may be aware like this uh, you know like all of these efforts though it is bearing you know like a positive you know like a results but it is not enough you know it is not sufficient to you know like a thought and you know like a, a bring back you know like that normal position of the climate right. So that's why you know like these efforts must go on with a much faster you know, like rate. An unmistakable incentive in the form of an increased forest carbon price is needed. Upfront investment in red plus readiness and implementation must continue and be scaled up. Integrity is key to ensuring real robust emission reductions. There is no progress towards equity. Forest countries are at the heart of delivering needed emissions reduction and IPLCs have a key part in this process. Lastly, although more than half the time to meet the gigaton milestone has passed, less than one quarter of the needed commitments have been made. We urgently need to scale up action and finance for forest-based mitigation to achieve this milestone and avoid catastrophic climate change. If we succeed in this goal, vital targets for climate and nature remain within reach. Another report from United Nations Environment Program, it is available you know, uh, over internet on their website, I would suggest uh, a reading. This talks about adaptation gap, you know, like a report 2022. So the title says, too little, too slow. Climate adaptation failure puts world at risk. Okay. So some snapshots, I'm giving you just the executive summary. Rest of the report, I would suggest uh, reading for you. Climate risks are increasing as global warming accelerates. Strong mitigation and adaptation are both key to avoiding hard adaptation limits. So in this figure you can see global surface temperature change increased relative to the period 1850 to 1900s. Okay. So you can see here 1950 up to 2000 you know this rate of change has been like you know like a little you know, like a gradual right. But suddenly, you know, it, it took actually this turn, you know, like it, it took a spike, right. So in this, uh, you can see like a different scenarios are drawn, you know, through different you know, like a colors, okay. So SP5, you know, 8.5 is shown with this one, the sharpest, the, the steepest one, the highest one, and then gradually the lower ones, like shade representing very likely range, you know, SPP3, you know. 7.0 is here and then this green one is here, turquoise one is here and blue one is here, right, these ones. So definitely we want, you know, like a, this blue, you know, like a curve so that by the end of, you know, like a, this century, you know, like this can be controlled, right. Well, regions for concern, you can see in this uh, graph over here, impact and risk assessment assuming low to no adaptation, right. So risk very high, you know, is shown in this uh, by this color and uh, high by red color, yellow by um, uh, yellow color and undetectable in uh, white, right. So gradually you see RFC 1, you know, unique and threatened systems, you know, the concentration of uh, this, you know, like a, uh, you know, like a violet is very high. And gradually with RFC 2, RFC 3, RFC 4, RFC 5, you know, that is reducing, right. So this is what, uh, you know, like uh, is the preferred one. Adaptation must not be sidelined because of large scale non-climate and compounding factors. Global efforts in adaptation planning, financing and implementation continue to make incremental progress but fail to keep pace with increasing climate risk. More than 8 out of 10 countries now have to least at least one national adaptation planning instrument and they are getting better and becoming more inclusive of disadvantaged groups. The adaptation finance gap in developing countries is likely 5 to 10 times greater than current international adaptation finance flows and countries to widen. So you can see here in this uh, uh, you know like a picture national plan strategy law or policy in place yes 
it is shown by green in progress light green no is shown in yellows right so you can see very few countries are in uh, yellow right and uh, a very few again are in light yellow right but most of the planet fortunately is in the green color yeah next in this picture we see adaptation finance needs included in developing countries ndcs or nap's yes that affirmation is given by you know like very few countries you can see over here in fortunately india being one of the countries right and many from uh, uh, africa a few from you know like a south america right and mostly like i have said no from south america and uh, yeah this china and many from uh, this side of uh, africa and middle east and somehow this part either data is not available or there is no communication which is unfortunate we do not know what is happening you know what do they say right so this report doesn't have you know like a data on this yeah in this uh, illustration in this uh, table you can see number of new adaptation projects per start year size and combined annual funding value under the adaptation fund green climate fund and the least least developed countries fund okay so you can see like uh, over the years you know it has uh, risen but somehow in this year year 2022 it came down right so ideally it should you know this should go up because these are new adaptation projects you know like a, so there should be more and more you know like adaptation projects yeah in this uh, like a figure we see an architecture of risk uh, risk reduction including principles actions and outcomes that can be used as a basis for addressing actual or likely adaptation effectiveness so the first vertical we have principles actions are here and then outcomes on this uh, these three columns so in principles we have good practices based on adaptation principles inclusion co-production transparency equitability div uh, uh, devolved and adaptive governance local ownership knowledge and integration avoid maladaptation addressing future risks minimizing mitigation and development trade offs flexible addressing structural drivers and of vulnerability actions there are three mitigation and adaptation actions adaptation action to reduce exposure to hazards and actions on structural drivers of vulnerability in outcomes we have reduced hazards reduced exposure reduced vulnerability finally enhancing resilience reduced risk and improved human ecosystem and well being at uh, planet level in this figure we have aligning climate change mitigation and adaptation actions differences synergies and trade offs so you can see with the differences these adaptations and uh, you know like from here it is going in the mitigations uh, trade offs right so different knowledge and information required to inform policy making distinct stakeholders distinct distributed impacts okay in the trade offs we have mitigation actions that increase exposure and vulnerability to climate change i would recommend you know like a uh, reading of this report yeah we, i have taken uh, another report this is uh, also from a uh, un environment program emission gap report 2022 i would suggest a uh, reading of this it talks about closing window climate crisis calls for rapid transformation of societies so i'm just giving you the executive summary of this report you can read you know more for you know like informed decision so the first point talks about testimony to inadequate action on climate crisis and the need for transformation that we have established already earlier point 2 talks about global ghg emission could set a new record in 2021 point 3 talks about ghg emissions on highly uneven across regions countries and households those you know like some listing is given over here you can see is a very important you know like a figure for information it talks about total ghg emissions okay so the total ghg emission is highest by china then us then india then eu 27 indonesia russian federation brazil international transport right but the moment you go to check the per capita ghg emission you know the whole scenario actually changes you know 
USA comes at the top most you know like uh, you can see almost 15 you know like uh, tons of uh, like a CO2 you know like a per capita okay very high you know at the world level you know like the highest you know coming from United States of America that's why these two actually tables are uh, essential you know like to see even if like uh, some of the countries are uh, producing you know like a high you know volume of GIGs but per capita you know like a consumption per capita GIG is coming from uh, you know like some of these countries the USA topping that then Russian Federation and then China so China is the largest emitter as well as third largest you know like a per capita you know like a consumer per capita emitter also of uh, like you know, these uh, GIGs Brazil coming fourth Indonesia U27 overall world and then India you will see is here you know like way below the world's average that's why this table is very important you know the world average you know extends you know somewhere above six okay and the Indian average in Indian per capita is less than three I think two point you know like something you know over here right and uh, USA topping by almost you know, like a 15 tons of CO2 you know, like a per capita right so this shows this illustration actually shows the disparity in emissions okay so which country needs you know like to plug in more right is is, is given right over here so India fortunately is doing wonderful because its per capita emission is way below like a world's you know like average but yeah we know like a which country needs you know like the countries which are definitely above the world's average you know they must you know control it at any cost fourth point despite the call for countries to revisit and strengthen their 2030 targets progress in COP26 is highly inadequate so you can see the you know like uh, this table right yeah this figure actually talks about global GHG emission under different scenarios and the emission gap in 2030 so it's a projection based this thing you can see you know like a this real data up to like a, this year and then this part is the projection one okay which talks about uh, if it is under you know like a considerable range 1.5 degree centigrade then what will happen and if it goes as it is then what happens okay so current policy scenarios shown in blue unconditional NDC scenario shown here in uh, uh, yellow and then red conditional NDC scenario in red and then we have this uh, blue light dotted you know like a blue and this green one so this is what you know like the world desires saving more and more so these are the numbers you can see on this side okay till blue what is needed you know what, what is there and uh, for green you know like what is there this figure talks about emissions trajectories implied by NDC and net zero targets of G20 members right so you can see Argentina Australia going down Brazil going down Canada going down China going up okay and the volume is also very high if you see this number this is 15,000 here right so national emissions in uh, metric tons you know like a co2 per year over time eu it is coming down india also it is going up but stands at 5000 indonesia is coming down japan coming down republic of korea is coming down russian federation is going up okay saudi arabia also slightly going up south africa coming down turkey it's going up sharply 1000 at the scale of like this is here 1000 united kingdom is coming down usa also it's coming down yeah so in this table you will see important actions to accelerate transformation in electricity supply industry transportation and buildings by different you know like actors so national governments international cooperation subnational governments businesses investors private and uh, development banks and common citizens so electricity supply on this hand on this column we have industry transportation and buildings right this figure talks about food systems emissions trajectory and mitigation potential by transformation domain right so this is this uh, GOG emissions you know it looks like it's going to rise 
okay so demand side changes you can bring down protection of uh, ecosystems by that we can bring it down farm level improvements can be been uh, been down you can bring it down decarbonizing supply chain also we can uh, know like a have to bring it down to the level of you know like a 2 degrees centigrade or you know like a 1.5 degrees you know like a centigrade target then uh, lastly we have this here finance flows and mitigation investment needs per sector type of economy and region averaged right so you can see the sectors are here and uh, yeah regions are given over here cub27 ends with announcement of historic loss and damage funds right so this is it with the it, it ends with in negotiations that went down to the wire over the weekend countries reached a historic decision to establish and operationalize a loss and damage fund particularly for nations most vulnerable to the climate crisis the agreement was stuck early sunday morning as leaders concluded talks on the two week long united nations climate conference 70 cop 